All right, I've started the recording. Okay, so this is going to be about assembler in general. Um, but as I explained to Julia, the reason that I feel that it'd probably be better to start with an 8 bit assembler, and I chose 6502, I actually do know two 8 bit assemblers, which is Z80 and 6502. But I chose 6502 because I find it a little bit easier to handle at the beginning. Um, and I've also used it more probably because it has online resources to use stuff on. So if I just want to code something for fun, I can go to a website and start doing it. With Z80, I actually have to start going back to programming the Game Boy Color, and that takes forever because I have to set up an environment and everything. But um, I think it's important to learn Assembler. It'll teach you more about how computers work. And we'll just go to the next slide. Well, oh, and I'm Donnie Baker. I forgot to mention that. I, I was told to mention that. Um, I, uh, I like programming things for fun. Can anyone hear me right now? <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I like programming things for fun. And, you know, someday I hope to make a million dollars. So uh, that's all you need to know about me. And also, if you guys already are on the Telegram, get to the telegram i'm about to get to it i swear i just haven't actually i installed the software i didn't actually get a chance to get to it and sign up yet okay so there are some truths and lies about assembler and uh these will help everyone i think at the beginning this is kind of big i think but um one truth is that you'll get a better understanding of hardware at the low level and that will make you a better programmer um, another truth is an easy way to gain that knowledge is by learning an assembly language. And then the last lie is you will be more productive if you code everything in assembly language. There's a reason we have abstraction. There's That's definitely. Love abstra <laughs> There's a reason that we love abstraction. Um, but there are certain things that I, I see over and over again as a programmer where I'm like, I don't know if abstraction is always helping us. So it sometimes helps to remember computers are dumb. They don't know the things we know. They don't know how to, you know, multiply to 400 numbers without like having to think about it and things of that nature. Like we, we are just, we're better than them. They're faster, but we're just better. Um, not everyone's going to agree with that. <laughs> Um, this is binary. Uh, you guys have probably seen binary before. If you don't do assembler, you probably don't use it as much as I do. Um, but maybe you do. I don't, I don't know what you guys do with your time. Um, you know, binary is a base two system. So it's places, unlike our places, go up um, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. 256, 512. It'd be really difficult to deal with binary like that. Um, we uh, know that the first four digits can add up from the number zero to 15. So we separate them into two hex, uh, in a byte, we ha separate them into he two hexadecimal dis digits, which we call four bits is called a nibble. If you've never heard that before, now you know it's called a nibble. We like to be cute in programming world if you if you haven't heard that before. Um, we're, Byte, nibble, all of those things. They're, they're really cool. Um, does everyone understand this? Or I just want to make sure that before I go on with this, this is going to be kind of important because I'm going to use a lot of hexadecimal and I'm going to use some binary, probably not as much as I use the hexadecimal directly. Right, I do. You do that? You don't understand it? Yeah. Okay. And so um, this is some 6502 assembler that simply is going to check if we um, have a greater than less than condition. We're going to return zero if we are less than. And if we're greater than, we're going to return the number one. Um, what this does is compare, which is at the very first instruction here, is comparing to the memory ad the the number in the memory address zero zero. So let me hit this button. So what we would do is we would load a number into the accumulator, the number one in this case, we would store that in zero, and then we would load the accumulator with the number A, 
which is the equivalent of 10 in decimal. Um, and then we would compare those. And what a compare actually is, is we'll go back to this, but I just want to mention it briefly here, is a compare is a subtraction. We're subtracting, but we're not actually keeping the result. We're just seeing if we're actually going to carry. So if you were to subtract a bigger number from a lesser number, a carry would occur because a bigger number um, will, will result in a negative number, but not in really, not in computer world. Um, unless we talk about two complements, which we won't get into just yet. Um, so what we're going to do after we do this comparison, we're going to compare zero, whatever numbers in zero, to the accumulator, which is A, the, the register A. And in this case, the register A is 10, and then the, the number in zero is the number one, because that's what we put into it at the very top of the code. And then if the carry is set, we'll say that A is greater than one, which would be true, 10 is greater than one. And we would go ahead and branch if carry set to greater than, which is that line, oh, this is written wrong. I forgot, I had fixed this in some code earlier, but I forgot to fix it in the PowerPoint. But greater than should be the lowercase g there. We'll probably write this code for real later so I can show you exactly what this means if anyone's getting confused at this point. Don't get too confused. The truth is, is that I'm, all I'm showing you at this point is mnemonics. Uh, load accumulator with the number in hexadecimal zero one is the first line. So that's all you need to know is that you're loading what's a register. So computers have registers for anyone who's unaware of that situation as of yet. Uh, the 6502 computer has only three registers. Well, it has more registers. It only has three user registers. And that's A, X, and Y. It also has PC, which is the program counter, and flags register, which we don't deal with directly as, as programmers, well, as um, assembler programmers. But we will use the results, like the compare sets a flag result called carry. It also can set a flag result called um, zero, because if, if you were to compare two like numbers, like five and five, you would come up with zero. And so you wouldn't have a carry occur because five minus five would produce zero and would not go into the next space and produce what's called a carry. But if you wanted to know whether or not a number was both greater than or zero, then you'd need to compare both the, um, both the flag zero and the flag carry. And so that would mean that there'd be a branch equals here as well to do the same thing, to say greater than equals. Uh, if two numbers are the same, they, are, they subtract to zero, but that also means that they're equal. Five minus five is zero, but it's also, they're the same number, they're equal to each other. This isn't as complicated as like equality in um, like triple, what is it, triple equals 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 and equal equals and all that stuff. We're simply talking about whether a number is equal to another number. It doesn't matter where we put it in memory or any of that nonsense. It may matter later, but it doesn't matter. Right now. Um, and then all we're doing is we're loading with the accumulator with the zero or one, depending on what our result was so that we can have that returned. What might be best here is to stop here for a second and go out of the share and actually look at this code in uh, the assembler. Because I'm probably confusing people right now and I feel that, but I'm trying not to. But We'll just put nine there. And then we don't actually need the greater because we don't loop through this or anything. So we don't actually need that, but we can put it here just to have it. We'll also look at the hex stump of this after we're done, just so you guys can see like what, so machine code is just the zeros and ones. This is of course, just our convenient way of naming those zeros and ones so that we can kind of know what they mean. Um, here. I 
I don't remember what we were trying to understand. I'm sure this is it. Okay, look at all those numbers there um, for a moment, but then we'll just look at this. And this is the hex dump of all those numbers. So you'll see the A9 and then the 0, 1. Well, we have a 0, 1 second. So that A9 is actually what is load A. So LDA is really just A9. But no one memorizes all of these numbers to what codes they represent. So you generally memorize the codes and, and forget that the that they actually have numbers underneath them. 85, 0, 0, same thing. We got store A, 0, 0. A9, 0, 9, we, same thing. We got load A, 0, 9. Um, you'll notice that there is nothing here for greater. If, if you, I don't think anyone's going to have any questions about that, but if, you're, if that's confusing you or anything, greater is just telling me where I'm at. It's not a thing that the computer cares about. It's a thing I care about. Like, I want to know greater. Um, when we jump to greater than later, we do actually do that with some stuff, and that's going to involve two's complement <laughs> and other things, so we'll, we won't get into that just yet. But we're here with the 00, A909, C500, which is the compare 00, and then B003, which means we're going to go three bytes ahead. This is actually fairly easy because we don't go backwards. Um, we're going to go three bytes ahead to, uh, so you have three bytes ahead would be, we have the load A number zero, zero and the RTS. So that would put us right here where the greater than is, or really it would put us right here where the load A number zero, 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 one is. I lost that little pop-up. So that's what the three means. It just means go ahead three, um, but we can also go backwards. And when we go backwards, that's going to involve the two's complement. And that's what I was talking about being complicated before. Then we'll load with zero one, and then we'll also return here. So we can choose either option we want. Um, when we run this in A right here, we get the number one, which means it got down here to greater than. So nine is greater than one. If we did this in reverse and assembled and run, A is zero. So not one is not greater than nine. Is that making any sense so far? I mean, I know you guys know that one isn't greater than nine. I mean, the assembly is the assembly making any sense? Yeah, but um, I just have uh, one question. Did you actually have to remember this command to be able to write it? See all this load, um, store, so um, to say load and store. Yes, yes, you do. But to be honest, it's easier than you think. Um, it is. Uh, there aren't so many. There aren't that many codes, and we reuse codes in different ways. Like earlier, I wrote some code here, and well, we can look at it. So if I want to load a from zero, zero, some part in memory. That means it's not a number. A number would be this, but I don't want to load from a number. I want to load from a part of memory. So let's say I want to load from 600. Um, and I want to load A from 600. And then that's all I want to do, to be honest. Um, does anyone know what number that's going to be? Oh, no, you don't, because I didn't explain that this starts at 600 yet. This starts at 600. Does anyone have any idea what that number is going to be? Not at all. It's going to be load A. It's whatever load A re represents. So load A is A. Whoops, run it again. Mm, reset. Maybe I have to erase it all and do it again. OK. There, AD. And now if we do a hex dump here, AD is the first part of the instruction. It's, and we start off at 600. And this is where I should have probably shown you that we started at 600 earlier. And that would have given you the answer probably. Um, so we're just loading the instruction AD into A, not for any reason, we just wanna do it for fun. But I don't have to do that. I can load real numbers. I could just go, um, this is an eight bit system and it's, it's more 8-bit than some other 8-bit systems because the Z80 is also 8-bit. 8-bit was 
originally defined by data buses, um, but the Z80 had 16-bit, um, and that, that part's nice. It has 16-bit uh, registers. And so you can do things like you could load it with a number that's 16 bits. So you could do FFFF. And you can't do that on uh, 6502. You can load FF. And if you want to load a bigger number, or if you want to jump to a bigger number, um, and but you want to jump to a bigger number that you would carry in a register, you probably you wouldn't carry it in a register. You put it in zero page, which is an architecture thing that I'll have to explain. But it's not the most important part at this point. To be honest, like most code, you want to see something on the screen. You want to get something going. Um, our comparison where we did greater than, less than essentially just a moment ago um, is fun, but it, it doesn't show us anything and it doesn't, it doesn't get anything started. So it, what we'll discuss right now is this particular machine from 0200 to 05 FF has um, that's where that's where your graphics are. That's a thousand. That's three FF or a thousand twenty four bytes of video memory essentially. So if you wanted to write to the last pixel, you could load a a number. Um, this only does sixteen colors. So no matter what you put in this first middle, if you put F E one, it doesn't matter. They don't read it. The only thing they read is the second number here, that, that second nibble. Um, this is a flaw of the program, in my opinion, as it would be much cooler if I could just either write 256 colors or if I could at least like write two colors at once by going like that. But that would be complicated and they wanted to keep it simple. So they decided that you could only write 16 colors and it would just be the last, the last four bits are all that's looked at. So we load that and then we store A into memory 05FF. And that's gonna be this last pixel right here. And so we can assemble and run it. And there's a pixel right there. If you can see it on the bottom corner right there. It's really tiny, probably. I can make it bigger. Still tiny though. It's a 32 by 32 display. This is what it felt like writing. And I did write very briefly for the Dreamcast VMUs. Um, me and a friend were writing a race car game for it. Uh, it wasn't very good, but we did write that um, because it was based off the same processor that they used in the Game Boy Advance. And I'm always amazed by that, and I hope you are too, that the Game Boy Advance ran on the same processor that they basically used for the VMUs for the Dreamcast, even though they only had a 32 by 32 black and white screen. That's crazy. I had no idea about that. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to write to the first pixel, you'd write to 200. So if you want to write up here at the very first part, 200. If you want to write right next to it, you go 201. And so writing to memory, I, these, so far we've just been using a lot of load A, store A. We'll have compares, and, but we'll also have other, so he maybe has a good tutorial part on this. Nope, I don't like that. Um, so there's another assembler just like this. And the only reason I'm going to it right now is because in his help section, he has a cool set of opcodes. So you can look at all the opcodes. This is what you'd have to memorize, these, these things here. And most of them are mnemonics. They're, they mean something. So this means add with carry. This means and. This means arithmetic shift left. This means branch carry clear. This means branch carry set. This is branch equal. This is an unused code that no, no, I, I'm just kidding. It's bit and you'll totally use it. Um, probably not, <laughs> even though he gives a cool little demo in here. Um, uh, branch, I believe this is branch if minus, like I don't really remember that one. Um, branch, yeah, branch on minus. So that's branch on minus. I don't ever use that. Branch not equal. Um, I'm guessing that's branch plus. I also don't really use that. Uh, break, which is for debugging. It's, it's just a way to break in assembler because we wanted to debug back in the day too. Uh, branch overflow clear. This one's a little complicated just because it's not the O and I, I just would prefer it be the O. But I, I really hate, uh, we'll get to it. Branch overflow clear, clear carry, 
clear decimal flag because they have a decimal flag. You can do binary coded decimal. No one does, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Clear interrupts, clear overflow. The compare operas, operation, compare X, which lets you compare X to something, and compare Y, which lets you do the same thing with Y. Decrement, decrement X, decrement Y, exclusive or, and that should be X O R in my opinion, but I'm just, I'm a fickle person. Increment, increment X, increment Y, jump, jump saving return. That may not be the actual name for the mnemonic, but that's what it does. It saves the return. It pushes the return to the stack. And then it, this, so jump is your go-to statement. This is your, like, essentially a function it's jump to subroutine or jump saving return or whatever it is we'll look it up in a minute it's jump jump to subroutine is what they say i also don't like that one um load a i mean I, I use it all the time i don't like the name of it load a load x load y uh logical shift right no operation the best op code in all of computer programming do nothing and i use it all the time uh, or A, which is just an or with the accumulator. I think they just wanted to keep them all uh, at least um, three characters. So they just had to add that A in there, even though they didn't do that with other ones. Um, push A, push processor, uh, push PC. It's the PC, um, it's, it's where you're at. So if you're, if you're, that might be so push where's that they just skipped right by it didn't they am i just missing that oh there it is Push processor status. Okay, so those are the status flags. Those are the actual flags that it's pushing. If it pushed the PC, that would be a 16-bit push and it can't do that. So I don't normally push the flags. So I, I don't know um, if that would be useful to me at any point, but it's not in general. Pull A, pull plot processor flags, rotate left, rotate right, ret uh, return from interrupt, return from subroutine, Subtract with carry, set carry, set decimal, set interrupt, store A, store X, store Y, transfer A to X, transfer A to Y, transfer stack to X, stack pointer to X. Uh, the stack in the 6502 is from um, 0100 to 01FF. You can use it as regular memory, but if it interrupts, like, so if you push, Whenever you're jumping somewhere, if you don't know this already, um, so load a number three. We have to store it first. Uh, I'd have to think about this code for too long. It's going to take me too long. So essentially, if I have something on the stack and I loaded it myself, and, and Square Enix used to do this all the time in programming NES games, they used to use the stack as if it was regular memory and do really funky stuff with it, which made a lot of the code really bug ridden. But um, no one noticed for many, many years until emulators started coming around. And then people were like, oh my God, look at what Square Enix did. How did this not break the entire program? <laughs> um, but they used to mess with the stack all the time. In general, just stay away from the stack. Don't, don't mess with 0100 to 01FF if you ever do have to code in an NES game you know, for, for fun and profit. Um, stay away from the stack. It's not going to be a thing. <laughs> it might be a thing. You never know. But you're probably going to end up programming just a S SNES or NES game lookalike if you ever had to do it. It wouldn't have to actually rely on the old systems. Uh, I don't remember where we were, but this is stack pointer to X, X to A, X to stack pointer, Y to A. 
So for the most part, I know all these T's are transfer. So I just look at the next two letters and I go, that's transfer A to X, transfer A to Y, transfer stack to X. Um, I know all these C's right here, not all these C's, I guess some of these are clears, but I know these C's right here are compares. And so I don't actually have to memorize all of these. What I'm really memorizing is just the ones that are unique. And all these branches are just, they operate on some flag and then I need to know what the flags are. Um, they mentioned the flags up here, the decimal mode interrupt flag, overflow flag, program counter, stack, times, wrap around. And then you can also see the flags. I'm pretty sure he lists them somewhere else that I've seen in here before. If he doesn't, then um, any other 6502 tutorial, two tutorial will go over it. There it is. Uh, no, that's not it. So he mentions what this affects. So rotate left affects the... Um, this is the... What's the end? So Danny, what can there are so many yeah. instructions here. And as you mentioned, you don't have to mem memorize all. You, you just have to be familiar with the um, most common ones. Would it be sure. possible if you can show us a little an example, like, you know, a scenario, how it works underneath? Like by putting up all these instructions together and then it yeah. can achieve something. Yeah, so um, that's easy enough. So I can, what I'll do is I'll first load A with the number zero, and this is more of a precaution than anything. These particular systems do not assume anything is in RAM. And for the most part, that's a general assumption that a lot of assembler programmers used to make. You should not assume that there's nothing in RAM because sometimes you could get corrupted RAM and you could actually have a situation where the system powered off, but there was still a value set in the RAM when you powered it back on. And so if you assume that it was going to be zero and it ended up being something else, your program could either crash or something else could happen, something weird could happen. Um, and so you should... What I'm saying here is just I'm going to load it with zero, but I don't think I need to because I'm pretty sure that the RAM is already loaded to zero because these systems are not um, like a real NES or a real Commodore 64 where they might still have something in that RAM position. But then I'm going to store that in uh, zero, zero, and then I'm going to load a number shift zero two and i'm going to store that into zero one and then i can load a number shift fe this is uh not number shift um so i don't want a number so normally in zero page which is ram from zero zero to ff that, that's just free ram that you can use and the beauty of that ram import, importantly for the 6502 so the zero page was all of the ram from zero zero to ff at zero zero. So the actual address would be zero 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 zero. So it's a 16 bit address. But what the guys who made the 6502 went is they said, well, we're just going to make some cool op codes that can just work directly on the zero page. So we can load A with zero zero. And we're actually loading from this address without having to use A three bytes, because this would take three bytes if we didn't do it that way, if we had to do this. And you can do this, by the way. You shouldn't. Um, if you're in zero page, you just use the two, the two, the two, the byte essentially instead of the two byte. But if you, if you like, I'm not always in zero page. If I wanted to get, say, I did need to get something from the stack. If I wanted to go and get something from the stack, I would have to type this. This is a bigger opcode, uh, which is the same thing as a mnemonic opcode, just means operation code. And this is three bytes long as opposed to two bytes long. And it also runs slower, not significantly slower. It was one cycle slower than the other way. So if I do this, it's one cycle slower. But these computers um, back in the day, especially the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, and the NES were very, very slow. They were, some of them were under a megahertz. Um, and to imagine that today, it meant that you couldn't really do very much with them. And this was, these were computers that people were using in their homes. The VIC-20 
Uh, my mom would not buy me a VIC-20 when I was seven years old. I remember it clearly because all I would do on it was play video games. She was sure of it. And it cost $300, which at that time was $800. Um, and so she was just like, it was, it was $300, but it's the equivalent to $800 in today's money. So she was just like, all it can do is play video games. And she didn't see any purpose for it in her life. And so, and, and, and neither did I, not for, not for $300, $800, whatever you want to consider that price. I was like, yeah, I'd probably just end up playing video games on it. I did program my first program on a VIC-20 when I was seven years old. And that's how I knew I was going to be a programmer, but I didn't program again until I was about 17 years old. So it was quite some time after that until I actually got on a computer and programmed again. That's not true. I did actually program something on a uh, uh, trash, a TRS-80. Um, but I didn't have a disk drive, so I couldn't save it. So anytime I, and it was all basic and you program in basic and I, I, uh, but anyways, these systems cost a lot. They had no power, no RAM, but we want to, in here, we have a zero page, but this is a special zero page. So this is a random number generator. So you can use this address, FE, for random number generation. If you wanted to get a key, you could use this address to get a key from the keyboard. And so these two were added by the people who make these emulators, essentially, so that you could easily do things like write a game or something in these little virtual systems without having to write your own random number generator, um, which we won't go over right now, but you can write your own random number, number generator. Um, what happens if you try to write to those addresses? Uh, nothing. Um, so, I mean, so something, you can write to them just fine. Uh, but um, if you write to them and then try to read from them, so like, let's let's do that. Let's, let's have fun. Um, we'll load A with number D9, just some random number. And then we're going to store A and, and that D9, and, that, that D9 there is a constant? Or is that it's a, a reference number? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a constant. It's, it's something in, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, so when we assemble this in our hex dump, that D9 is, is that number right there, the D9. Hold on, I was zoomed into your code. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, you got this other window. Yep. Yep, got it. I see. Yeah. And so that D9 is right there. So it's in ROM, essentially. Um, but it could have very well has just been in memory because I can actually make all of this run in memory if I wanted to. Like I said, these, these systems are not written to be real computers. They're ma made to be something that you can learn on. Um, so now what will happen is we can, we'll see this A change but it won't be D9. Well, it could be D9. Theoretically, it could be anything. But um, it was E6. And that just means that even though we stored something to it, which didn't affect it, well, it did affect it. At one point, there was D9 in there. In fact, we might be able to check that on this one. Uh, let's run it again. Okay, so going to D9. Uh, this, oh, because we got to that. Never mind. Let's debug and then do that. Same thing. And uh, that didn't work. Um, step. Let's see if we can do that. Uh, no. What is it doing? Oh, the random generator is just randomly generating numbers. It continued past. Um, let's assemble that again. And then hit debugger. And then we'll step. And now D9 is there. Everyone see that? But then if we, as soon as we read from it, the next line of code, it's 74. And now A is 74. So that's what happens. Uh, but it's, it, you could store things there temporarily. As long as you never read from it, that'd be fine. But what would be the point? Um, you know what? I do kind of wonder. I haven't ever tried this. Um, uh, what would be a good test for that? 
Um, I'm wondering whether or not I could store. So what we were going to do, what I was showing before uh, I distracted myself, um, is this. OK, load A, number shift, O2. OK, um, the O2 and the 00, those are important because, um, as I talked about earlier, from O2 to 5FF is where your video memory is. So we're literally we're loading that address. Now that address is loaded in, what is it, Big Indian or Little Indian? I can't remember. Uh, Mike, do you know when it's reversed? Uh, I don't like remember. Reverse the numbers. That, that's called something. I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it's Big Indian or Little Indian, E-N-D-I-E-A-N. Not, not Indian, but Indian. Um, so this is similar. So we're going to put 0, 0 into 0, and then 0, 2 into 1. And if we just assemble and look at that, that'll be down here and run. And now we have this. But this is really what, the, what I'm doing this for is so that I can have an access to an, a 16-bit address. I want to be able to access 0200. This is 0200 right here. It is in reverse order, which looks weird to us um, because we're human beings and not silly computers. But which of those is, is, hey, Donnie, which of those is the more significant? The 00? Zero, zero? The zero, well, so um, more significant. So the 02 is the, is the top part of a 16 bit address. And the bottom part of the 16 address is the zero, zero. So you're, yeah, so the address there is zero, two, zero, zero. So zero, two is the more significant yeah. byte. That means that this is little Indian. Little Indian, okay. Yeah. So, because in a, in a big Indian system, the more significant bytes are stored at lower addresses. But this is the more significant byte being stored at a higher address. Okay, this is still just storing A, but this is obviously not going to be the same as if we store A here, or if we were to store um, A into a 16-bit address. These are different codes, and they're going to have different binary representations um, in the system. So instead of it being whatever it was, I think it was AD or something like that earlier, it may not have been, I, that might have been something else that I was doing. That might have been load A. Um, but whatever it is, it's not going to have the same byte representation for what this is. But for us as human beings, we're going to see all of these as store A because that's what they do. They store into something. That's all we care about. And they store the accumulator into something that's important. That's what the A stands for. The accumulator is the register that we're working with here, as well as the Y register. But you'll notice I did not actually specify what the Y register is. But if we look over here on this system right here, it has been staying at zero. Theoretically, I should not rely on that either. But again, I'm an assembler programmer, and we're wild. We wear red gloves. Um, the uh, <laughs> nice. We do what we we do what we want to do. Yeah, just things me and Mike understand. Um, but uh, we're not going to store anything into Y. Though I could, I could just say right here we could transfer A to Y. And now A and Y will be zero. Um, and that's guaranteed now because I've, I've loaded A with zero and then I put A into Y. Uh, A doesn't get anything back from this. So it stays as zero as well. So if I was to load A with four, A would, so if we assemble this and run, A will be, uh, well, because A gets reloaded here. Uh, need to not reload there and not reload here. And this is how you comment code in, in this assembler. It's not how you code, uh, comment code in every assembler. Um, if you guys want to learn uh, 6.02 for either the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, or any other system, I recommend this assembler, which is um, Behillens. This is his GitHub page, but the actual page for it is here. And this can be for SNES, SMS, GG, which were Z80 systems, 
Game Boy, which was a custom processor, but it's based off the Z80. The PC Engine is a system that was based off of the 6502 called Huke 6820. Um, the SNES was a better, it's a 16, eh, was it? Um, it was a supposedly 16 bit uh, 6502. Um, it was the big daddy processor next to it. Um, the Apple IIe, I think, ran it as well, not just the SNES. Um, I don't want to revisit the whole uh, whether or not the SNES was a was eight bit or sixteen bit or or the seven TG Turbo Graphics PC Engine were that I will but I I don't want it. but if anyone wants to let me know but going back to the code going back to the code so we're going to load this with zero zero and this one with two and then we have this. And now, if I didn't want to, let's say I'm not going to make these values quite like this. I want this two to instead be um, a random value. So I could just load A from FE. And then I could and that, because I know that the amount of space that I can write to goes from 0, 0200 to 0, F5, to 0, 5, FF. So I could just end that with the number three. Um, if this doesn't make sense, let me go over this real quick. So if you have any number, uh, eight bit number in this case, let's do that number. And then you and something with three, which is this binary number, you're only going to get these two bits because the and only gives you, so, you know, you guys know the truth tables. One and one equals one. One and zero equals z zero. Um, one and zero equals zero, blah, blah, blah. Zero and zero equals zero. So we have a bunch of zeros and a one. So all we're going to get is this part of the number. Did not mean to back up that far. So essentially, we're going to get this number. And that's the number I want. Because if I get a random number, I don't care about any of the other bits. I only want the bottom two bits, the, the two's place and the one's place. So in a binary number, you have one's place, two's place, four's place, eight's place, 16's place. I only care about the two's and the one's place. Two plus one adds up to three, so I end by three. It does need to be the number three and not just the memory address three. Then because I don't want it to be just zero to uh, three, I actually need it to be two to five. I'm going to add the number two to it. So now it will be every number from two to five, because it can be the biggest number it can be is three. And if I add two to three, I get five. The smallest number it can be is two. And if I add two to zero, I can get two. So this is giving me a random address here. And so if I were to just run this code, let me load A into something. Now let's just load it into, well, no, we'll, we're random numbers. We'll just do random numbers. And then assemble and run this. Whoops, we need a loop. Forgot the loop. We'll jump infinite. By the way, if you don't like go to, this is go to. And I love go to. Okay. Okay, and that's how you love you love go to, but you hate if doesn't I make hate any. If. I only love go to because so many people go. It's not needed. It's totally needed. How else could I do this? Um, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, I I don't want to get rid of conditionals. I just don't like the statement if. I think it's it causes complications now. Why it's doing this? The only numbers I can have in the beginning of this number are two, three, four, five. So that's two, three, four, and five. That's where those positions are. And then I'm ro let, rotating let random values through them. Um, but I want to do this so I can cover the whole screen. So we will change this to, this would change the Y position. It won't really matter. Oh, we won't, we won't do that. We'll just change that. Um, and we'll just load this as a random number two. This we don't care about like we care to hear. What would happen if, well, we'll get back to that. 
we'll assemble that and run this. And this just does a bunch of random colors on the screen. And so we're loading, loading a random number. So the bottom of, so if you watch down here, you're seeing everything that's happening right there. And then we're just putting random values into those numbers. And since those numbers are all VRAM, well, it just continues on forever. But if I wasn't to do this, like say I just stopped this and got rid of these two lines. Well, now I could write to anywhere in memory. And that wouldn't be a problem until it was my code. Until I started writing to 0600 to it's one, two, this, this is two bytes, this is two bytes, so that's four bytes, six bytes, seven, eight bytes, 10 bytes. Uh, this is uh, 12 bytes, and then this is 15 bytes. So if I wrote anywhere from 060 to 06F, well, we're going to have a problem because it's going to overwrite my code. And then my code's not going to probably work unless it got lucky. I might get lucky a couple of times. Theoretically, it could accidentally put cool code in here and we could see any number of things happen. But it continues on until it eventually will write to. Oh, my. Is it ever going to write to? This guy might have protected his. I don't know. I feel like it should have written to it by now. There it goes. See, 0600, it wrote over load AFE. It wrote, um, we could save that value. And so whatever value this is, we can go ahead and uh, store this in 03. And then that way we can see what value it actually writes and see what kind of code it was trying to make happen. Oh, well, that one failed a lot sooner. 0657. Uh, hmm. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the, something there. I guess that makes sense. I think it's just, that's weird. Um, I'd have to think about that too long, and I'm not going to. So uh, um, 0657 doesn't actually affect our code. So the 57 must have been written after our code was already messed up. Um, my guess is that the uh, that it let it run to that point. 57 must be an opcode. It can also be an undocumented opcode. I need to mention those, I guess. Um, in a real NES or a real Commodore 64, there were undocumented opcodes that programmers could use, but you were told not to use. Um, if you wanted to be an official like software developer for like Nintendo, you were not supposed to use these codes because you could accidentally crash your entire game and you it would just be dumb. But in reality, they always are where they are. And so for the most part, unless Nintendo changed their hardware, your code would run. There was a case of only one uh, NES game that I know of where they actually reminds me of the uh, reminds me of the the Chompers in Galaxy Quest. It's like, why does this <laughs> exist? This has no 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 purpose. <laughs> but but um, so we can write to the screen, but. This is a good point about optimization here. Let's let's talk about that. This is pretty optimal code. 05, store A. I, I don't think you can get faster for writing to the screen than this right here. And that's very optimal. It's useless, but completely optimal. Um, optimal code is, is code that generally only wants to do one thing. Like the best optimization is code that only wants to do one thing um, there are system considerations that we could talk about, like page boundaries, or in more complex systems, there's a lot more we could talk about. But in this particular code right here, the optimization is bad because we're not checking anything. We're not, and we're not able to use this code for very much. Like I could theoretically do this and just blink this pixel. Um, These are just labels for addresses. That way I don't have to tell it exactly where I want it to run. I might be able to do that though. Because I think 
if I remember correctly, I can do this. I know I can do this in WLA DX. I don't know if I can do it in this assembler, but I should be able to do this. And that's the same as having, I'm just going back to this address. So rather than, um, then rather than have to put loop here, I, if I knew where my address was, I could just go, I want to go there. And it looks like it's going to work. Yeah, same code, same, same things happening with that code. Uh, there's a little blinking dot here if anyone doesn't see it. Um, but as you write longer and longer lines of code, you're going to forget where that number is. So you want to have a label so you can just go loop and then refer to that label and then your compiler well, your assembler would figure out okay you want to go to there which is 600 but you don't have to memorize that oh and you do need that otherwise it doesn't work um and same code now we do want it to we want to do that. We That was cool. That's neat that we can write a bunch of pixels to the screen, but we want to be able to write to a particular pixel on the screen. Like say I wanted to write to the uh, the X coordinate 15 and the Y coordinate 15, and I don't want to uh, have to spend too much time on it. Um, this is going to be easier if I just copy paste some code, I think, because I could write it, but it would I probably would make a mistake or two that would just annoy me so we'll just copy paste some code I wrote earlier. I have a bunch of it and not all of it's very clean but we'll do this. Um, I do write quite a few things in 6502 assembler I'll say for fun not for any real reason especially like most of the things I write nowadays end up in being in systems like this. Um, and the reason I write them that way is because like, I like to think through the logic of things. Um, this isn't one of those cases, but uh, I just I do write quite a bit of code in here, but you're never going to write code like this for your job. I, at least I don't think so. I would love to have that job if anyone gets that job. But now we can uh, we could load X with a random number. We want to cap that number so that it's only a value from 0 to 32. Uh, we could do number 32, which is not number 30, 31. 1F one is 31 because it's 15 plus 16. And we could load Y with 0 to 31 is 32 numbers. That's what that means. And then we could end that by 31. just to show what this would be if it was hexadecimal. And this is what I prefer working in is hexadecimal. So I don't often use decimal, but um, it may make it easier to read if it's like that. So I, I only wanna make sure that the numbers are between zero and 31. So I'm ending by 31. 31 has all the bits set. So it's just convenient here. Now, if I was working on a system that was a 640 by 480 screen, I'm not going to be able to do that same thing. There are other tricks I could do, but I couldn't do just what I did here uh, because there are certain things that it would let me write to if I just ended by 640. That doesn't actually get me anywhere. This is just very convenient because all the bits are set in 1F. This is 1F. So that's 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And then I can load A with FE, and I don't really care um, there. And then we'll jump to pixel set. And we'll, after, well, we'll loop. Uh, no, we won't. OK. OK, and it set the pixel there. Um, I do see a D9 in there, but I guess that gets corrupted here. I must not save the registers here. I did in a straight line um, example that I did earlier because you had to uh, make sure that the registers returned the same ways, but that's unoptimal. It's not as fast. So I did not do it when I 
created the pixel set algorithm. So I'm not keeping X and Y what they were. I can change them on the fly. Um, and I do, that's right, because I do all this logical shift right here. So going over some of this code, first things first, I'm gonna push A because I'm gonna need it later. But then I'm gonna transfer Y to A, B, and that's, I'm trashing it now because now Y is in A, and so I need A to come back at some point. Then I'm gonna push A again because I'm also gonna need Y later and I don't have it right now, but for right now, I'm also gonna take Y. Go ahead, what was your question? Hey, can you hear me? Um, I can hear you now, yeah. Hey, just general question um, about questions. Like if we, <laughs> if we have questions but don't want to interrupt, what's the structure of the presentation going to be like? Do you have an open question at the end or should we interrupt and ask a question along the way? That's what, um, it, it depends. If the question's about what I'm doing right now, then go ahead and ask the question now. If you're going to remember it to the end, that's fine too. Um, okay. But do remember exactly what we were doing at the time because, like, it may be hard for me to remember if, if it gets to that point. But, sure. Um, no did you have a question about this, or well, or just it's a not specifically about that? It, it's about something that you mentioned along the way, but it, I think yeah. it would be a tangent at this point. So I'll hold okay. on to it until the end. That that would probably be good. Also, um, right now while I'm sharing my screen, I don't often get to see the uh, the text. I don't know if I can make that happen. Let me see if I can. Where is the Zoom chat room? So if anyone else is anyone else in the chat, uh, uh, yeah, I'm anything? watching Donnie. So you're fine. Just go ahead. Okay. Please. Okay. So. Um, we could do this here and change this to uh, jump loop and then come back up here and do another loop. And this would do the same thing that we did earlier, um, but using our pixel set algorithm. And somehow we messed up there still. Uh, there are three roars. There are three roars. So the three LSRs, three LSRs, There's four roars. That's okay. That's what it's supposed to be. Oh, because this routine, no, that's fine. Oh. Well, that should be fine. Great, now there's a bug in my code. Oh, that, that probably would have been easier to see earlier. So if you do this, you get to see what the hex dump is right next to the actual assembler. So that might be easier to see when you're looking at it. Also notice that little Indian stuff right here. 0611 becomes that, so on and so forth. Oh, we'll, we'll debug this code together. Okay, we'll go over it and then we'll figure out what's wrong with it. So we're pushing A um, because I'm going to need it later, but then we're transferring Y to A and I'm still going to need that Y again later. So I'm also going to go ahead and push it as well. Then I'm going to end by 1.8. And the reason that I'm doing that is again, I only need the first, the three bytes of this number, because this number can only be between uh, zero to 32. So I want, so right now this number looks like this. It could be any number between zero, zero to one F. So it looks like this or this or this, or, you know, any number between this and, so any of these ones or zeros that I have all as ones right now, could be zeros. So all five of these digits here could be zeros, or one of them could be zeros, so on and so forth. But I only care about these two upper parts, because these two upper parts are the only part that are important for whether or not the Y is going down on the screen. Um, and so these two upper parts here are what I'm looking for. 
Um, and then I'm just going to shift right them until they're in the last bit position. And then I'm going to add two. I guess I could do that once and then add. Do, do, do. I'd put it, no, that'd put it double. It'd be multiply, not multiplication. It doesn't work. Um, so that's the right way to do it. So then I'm going to shift whatever bits are in here over, and then I'm going to add two, just like we did earlier, so that I can get some kind of form of 0, 02 to 0, 05 there, because these two bits will only be between the numbers one and three once they're shifted right twice. Shifting means literally shifting. So if you shift a number, this number once over, it's going to go to this number. Uh, we're going to delete that and put a zero over. And so whenever you shift over, essentially whenever you shift right, you're dividing by two. Whenever you uh, go the opposite direction, you're um, multiplying by two. Is it is it logical shift or arithmetic shift? It's it's a logical shift right. So zero goes in here, there's rotation right, and then that would put the carry into the position. Okay, so if you're shifting right, the rightmost bit cycles around to the left, or does it fill in with zeros from the left? It, so this bit here actually goes into your carry. So this bit here goes into your carry, but then logically zeros just come out the other end. So okay, so that would be, I believe that's arithmetic because okay. that would be like you described, that would be a division. So you have, you have basically the number dot one or dot zero with like your remainder, like you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So we can double check. Um, so I, I don't know, to be honest. No, I, but I that's okay. That's fine. Uh, I was just curious. We don't have to know. It sets so it shifts all by right one position. Zero is always shifted into bit seven, and the original bit zero is shifted into the carry. So this always has zero to the right for logical yep. shift right. Now, again, those names could have changed since the 6502 was a popular computer. It's only been 40 years. So you're probably right, but I, I don't know um, when that changed. Like, so this is considered logical at this point in time might not be anymore um but all we're using it for here we're not actually using it to divide all i really want to do is i want to get a number between zero and three and since i know these two bits right here are those two bits that i want that's what i'm shifting over and i just don't care about getting rid of these three bits because i also saved these these bits here and i'm going to use them later so when we get down here i go ahead and store that into one so that's very similar to what we did earlier. We stored something between two and five into one. And then I'm going to pull A, which if you remember, uh, if you guys don't know stack uh, stuff, then uh, it's, it's um, last in, first out. Last in, first out, yeah. Last in, first out, that's the right way to say it. Um, and so the last thing I put in was A, but it was because there's no way to push Y. That's the only reason I have to transfer Y to A and then push A. Um, some people call this, um, if you guys haven't learned, and, and we could go over that at some point, but in RISC computers and in reduced instruction set computers, you oftentimes have to do two operations to do one thing, but both of those operations are equally fast. So some people would say about the 6502 back in the day, it was the first RISC computer. It's not really but it shares some similarities in the fact that they cut out opcodes just to go, yeah, it would be simpler to just have a push Y, but it would take just as much time because we'd have to get that Y here and or cost more money for us to put a bunch of, you know, silicon on, on the whole thing. But they didn't want to spend that money and they didn't want to um, spend that time. So they just went, okay, we're just going to do push A. Theoretically, they could also just done macros and just said, if you want to push Y, we'll just have a macro that says transfer Y to A, push A, and then you could just call it push Y. And you can do that in real, like, so WLDX, which I showed you guys earlier, is a macro assembler. So if there's something that you do rather often, like say you want to do 16-bit division, if you wanted to do that a lot in whatever code you were writing, you would write a macro for it, and then you could insert that macro anywhere in where you needed to use it. 
You can also just write a function and always refer to the function, but anytime you're jumping or jumping, saving the return address or anything like that, it's slower. So on machines that ran at less than one megahertz sometimes, it was not worth it to do that. So you really literally have to rewrite the code in every time. That's why we had macros and that's why we would just type the macro instead of the whole line of code that I needed to divide a 16 num bit number by a 16 bit number. So there are ways to make this easier too. There are ways to make this uh, not as easy as um, high level languages, but easier than it was when we first started off with the idea. Um, I still recommend learning this first before you go into all that, because while that can be fun and easy, um, you're not going to know what it's always doing. So if you don't know how to do it yourself, then you may not know how, it, how that works. Obviously, that's the problem I'm having here too. Uh, but then we, uh, we, after we stored that into a, stored A into one, we popped that Y, and now I'm going to end it by seven. And I'm going to get just these last three bits because that's four plus two plus one. So I just want to get those last three bits. Whenever I end by a number, I'm getting those numbers there. And then I'm going to rotate it right through the carry because I could do this a different way. I could do it instead of that, I could do this. But if I did that, I have to do five instructions of ASL. So I do ASL, ASL. This should be functionally the same, but it's one more instruction. So I'd rather just rotate through the carry because I only need these three bits and I just need them in the top position. Now, if I rotate, if I shift them left five times, they'll be in the top position because they're the last three bits. So I just want to turn these into this. And I could do that that way. Um, that was just a little hack to try and get some speed out of it, but it's obviously not much speed. Um, these are slow computers. They're not meant to be speed demons. But it's always fun to optimize even when you hate it. Um, then I end that by EO. Why did I end it by EO? It's a good question. I don't think that code's supposed to be there. Um, it will be EO. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know why that code's there. That code doesn't need to be there. Um, then I'll transfer X to A, put A into Y. So X is now into Y. I'll pull A again, and then I'll store A, and the A from previously was this random number. So I'm just pulling that random number back out of the stack. We can step through this. Um, assembly? Uh, assembly? Uh, is there an error? It says, oh, I can't have all that stuff. You mean I can't just write random things in the code? Yeah, we can put a comment here. And that should work. There we go. OK. And that's not what I meant to do, though. So we'll erase the line, put a line, assemble again, and then go to debugger. And we'll step through it. We're going to load a random number into x. That's what a3 is. We're going to load a random number into y. That's what de is. Um, we'll eventually load a random number into a. We're ending all these by 3. Oh, 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 that's what I did wrong. So again, this is how, how drunk I am right now. Um, so what we'd have to do here, the first things, we wouldn't do this. We do this. Um, so that thing that I mentioned about risk computers, this is the same situation. I can't and X with number 31. So I need to actually load A with FE and 31, and then transfer A to X. And I need to do that same thing to F or to Y. So then we'll transfer A to Y. And that's why our code broke, because I didn't remember that. OK, now the code will go smoothly and not stop randomly. Um, because those numbers do need to be done. But if I didn't want to do that, so I want to comment out these ands anyways, and I just want random numbers to go, our code will eventually fail again. It failed again. Because eventually it started to write somewhere where it shouldn't write to. Not to that position, though. 
It's fine. Um, it needs to stop. I don't know. I, I'd have to step through it. It'd take forever. It wouldn't be fun. Um, so there are better debuggers out there than this. This is a good debugger for learning on, but this is not um, great. I, I can jump to a position, but I can't jump to it like citing that I want it to go through it this many times before I get there. Or can't watch the position for if it changes to the number six. If you guys, do you guys do a lot of debugging? Like when variables change or something like that? Maybe in JavaScript or Java? I use lots of print apps. <laughs> lots of print apps. Yeah. Lots, yeah. lots of print apps. No, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm a that's fan. Free, I'm that's a fan. Free, that, that is debugging. It's kind of prehistoric debugging, but yeah, that's debugging. It's not. I mean, so what we did here is, so we have an opcode called break. And what break does is what you really just do with it is you would just change any opcode to break. And then it would, it, this won't work here because this does not actually use interrupts, but then it will trigger an interrupt with that break. And then whatever code you have there in that interrupt, it will, when it returns, it will return one number after this. So it'll return to the TAX. Um, it's really archaic. Uh, <laughs> But that's how you would debug before there were before there were fast enough computers to actually have debugging on the same computer that you had the uh, program running on. Um, but to maybe show this a little bit better, we can we can do this. We could load X because we know numbers. Um, we could load X with. Uh, the midpoint of 1f is uh, 0f or 10, depending on which way we want to look at that. But we'll load x with of, we'll load y with the same of. Uh, and then we'll uh, load a. Doesn't really matter. We can uh, just do a random number. Um, and now it's just that middle pixel. And so we're in the middle of the screen, essentially. Um, and so if I wanted to do the bottom of the screen and wanted to do that same thing, I could write that position there. Oops. Oh, was it doing? Oh, it is doing it. I see it. I wasn't even paying attention. I just started running. Um, if I want to write. Uh, zero, zero here for the X, but I want it at the bottom left hand, left hand side, left hand side. Yes, yeah, left, left hand side. It's there. I want it halfway down instead of all the way down. So now I can write to anywhere in the screen. So now I could write a video game. I could, I could take this information and write a video game. I, I wouldn't with this because, um, I don't know if this pixel set algorithm is actually that optimized. Uh, I actually had one. So I had a uh, another tutorial website um, thing. I don't know what all that is. So I probably should have had this open to begin with. Um, so this was a thing that I wrote like just to do HTML um, for a uh, coding thing that I was doing. And it's not all that informative, but it's got some information on it that I think is worth going over sometimes. Uh, one is that Bender runs on a 6502, and that's important for everyone to know, because if a computer from the future can run on 6502, then you know that's that's going to be a thing. Also, the Terminator ran on 6502. So, so now you have the Terminator and Bender and Kabuki Quantum Fighter all run on 6502. And now you guys know that. Uh, anding, oring, and zoring, and all that cool stuff is right here. Um, does anyone know how to do zor encryption? So like this, um, it's enlarged. So you have a value that's 041 in hexadecimal and 65 in decimal, and that's the ASCII letter A, capital A. And then you have an encryption key, which is just going to be, in this case, it's F8. And F8, ZOR, 
65 comes out to this number, which is, uh, that would be C, uh, no, uh, B, that would be B9. So B9, so we get B9, but then if we did that same thing and we did B9 versus the encryption key of F8, then we get back to 65, which is the letter A. This is a form of encryption. It is, by the way, the most secure encryption that has ever existed. Um, and no. that's kind of a lie, but it's also not 100% not wrong. Like if your key is as large as your encrypted data, it could never be just randomly guessed. Um, unfortunately, that's not realistic. Um, so if you wanted to encrypt a text document that's 400 pages long, then you would have to write a key that's 400 pages long. And then somehow you'd have to memorize that key for later so that you could bring it back and get the document back from the encrypted state. Not the best way to do things. Um, but what we generally do with Zor encryption and why it's considered unsafe is you normally Zor by like a key, like say you have a secret, secret's your key. So you Zor encrypt by the word secret, you'll get the binary values for the ASCII of secret, and then you'll Zor encrypt everything in that document by that. Then it can be found because eventually someone will find something that seems like a word and they will crack your encryption by looking at that. But this was used for a really long time for just fun reasons, not for any security reasons, um, just to encrypt like simple communications and stuff, just so that you know there could be uh, some level of encryption on things. And also, it's it's pretty much the same encryption you have on your computer right now, so it's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, there's something. I see that uh, chat has three things. I'll join the Telegram group. Okay. Yeah, I should have posted those. Um, so there's that. Then there's this. This is a um, this is a part of a half adder. And what this is saying is that the way computers add is they use a Zor gate and an AND gate. So if you understand Zor and you understand or exclusive or and you understand AND, AND is how you get the carry. And S and, and Zor is how you get the add. So if you if you Zor one by zero, you get one. Zor one by or zero by one, you get one. So that would be right for the number adding. But if you then took those same two numbers, so say you were doing one plus zero. Well, if you first Zor them, you get one. So that's right. One plus zero is one. There's no carry on it, so it doesn't go up to give it three or anything. But if you did have a carry on it, it's like say the number uh, the number three. So you wanted to add one plus or the number two really one plus two one plus one. You absorb one by one, and zero is exclusively or since one or one are not exclusive, they're the same values. It equals zero, and then. The AND value would equal one. So that would set the carry value. You would then put the carry value into the two's place. And that is how computers add. Um, they really just, they still do this. Um, it's just, they do it much faster and, and with much smaller stuff now. But this is how we got to computer world, guys. Um, and then multiplication, you do it with a shift. Uh, as I explained, when you shift to the left, you get a multiplication by two. If you then added the value that you originally had to that value, you'd be multiplying by three. If you wanted to multiply by four, you could shift twice to the left and then multiply by four. So if you shift twice to the left, the number two, it becomes the number eight. But if you wanted to shift by five, uh, you wanted to multiply by five, you would shift to four and then add the number again. So you add the number one again. So if that was confusing, it's, it's not my fault. It is my fault, but stop blaming me people. Um, we're gonna stop that. But what all that's saying is if you have the places 128, 64, 32, 16, eight, four, two, and one, and you have some numbers in these places, zero, 
zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Oh, by the way, if you didn't notice earlier, there is no multiplication on the 6502. There is no division on the 6502. So this is how you had to do it on the 6502. Um, you could also do lookup tables. So another way to do multiplication is lookup tables, um, just like you did, well, maybe, I don't know what everyone's school life was like, but when I was younger, they would make you memorize multiplication tables. And that's essentially one other way computers could do it. You could set up a, essentially an array or an, an area of ROM really, where you could have all these numbers where they're multiplicants of three, and then just go anytime I'm multiplying by three, I need to refer to that array and then just go to whatever position I wanna multiply by three. So if I wanna to go to the eighth position and multiply three times eight, the number 24 will be there. So that was one way to do it. But the easier way to do it as far as, wasn't necessarily faster, it was just a matter of, it was, less it took up less space and computers back in the day also didn't have a whole lot of that so if you wanted to have all of the multiplication tables you weren't going to be able to store them all in most old computers um so this is what we did we we shifted things so i have that now and i have the number 16 here but i could move it over one and it become the number 32 by putting a zero here and that's 32. But now if I had that 16 still, and I, I could bring it back and then go, now I just want to add those two numbers together. 32 plus 16 is 48. And that's multiplying by three. And so on and so forth. So that's how you used to do multiplication. Division was very similar, except for the fact that because we have remainders in division, um, if you needed that data, if you needed to have that that remainder information, you would need to do something a little bit more complex because as numbers decreased in values and remainders were produced, um, you would have to find those remainders and such. So there's some good code. Um, on, there is a lot of websites on the, um, ah, my computer's just slow now. It's running too much 6502 assembly, that's what it is. Um, but on this, which I'll share somehow, I don't, I don't know. Uh, okay, uh, we'll look at that later. Oh, why did I do that? Okay, I didn't finish this stuff. So there's this website right here, FFD2. Oh my God. Let's just go to it in the actual thing. That's not what I meant to do. I meant to do that. Maybe not. Oh, I'm not on the page, that's why. Okay, so that, that website right there, ffd2.com slash fridge, that is a website mostly dedicated to Commodore 64, but it has a lot of information on 6502. Um, when I used to do NES coding, or even uh, I did program some TG16 stuff, not games, but like little demos and stuff. Um, I used that website a lot because there was a lot of like in that, C equals hacking, which was a zine back in the day. Um, they had a lot of information about how Commodore 64 coders would code music engines and things like that. And at that time, I didn't know how to do any of that. Um, I had been ripping uh, what were called NSFs at that point, um, but I didn't know actually how to make my own. Uh, in, in NSFs are in Nintendo sound format. They're similar to chip tunes, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, it's like, it's not quite MIDI because you're actually getting like, you'll have three square waves and a, and a noise channel to make your music. And with the NES, if I remember correctly, it was two square waves, a triangle wave and a noise channel. And you can make your beautiful music with that. And I love a lot of Nintendo tunes. Um, but I grew up in that era and not everyone loves them as much as I do. But um, 
I, I knew how to rip those. And I also knew how to, when I was writing my own code, I could take someone else's music from a game I loved, which one of my favorite games to rip off was the Goonies soundtrack, because I just loved the cover of uh, Cindy Lauper's Good Enough. Um, and I would put her thing in almost every demo I released. It would just be the Goonies theme song playing over and over again. If you never played the Goonies, it's an excellent game. But if you never heard Cindy Lauper's Good Enough for You, uh, are you good enough to be a Goonie? I think as it says that in the name on the music video, if I remember correctly. It's awesome. You should check it out. Um, but that website's also good to check out. Um, it's a good resource of 6502 stuff. And it has at, um, great algorithms for like, if you want to know how to multiply by six, uh, 16 bit number by a 16 bit number and get a 32 bit number. Um, which is not, it's not a hard task, but it's not a trivial task in um, 6502 assembler. It's compared to, uh, to a modern computer that actually has multiplication. Um, it has information on that. It has other algorithms that are really cool, stuff like that. Um, next we'll write a star field. Uh, uh, so, in, I'm not really going to write this. I did actually think about writing it, but I didn't actually write the code before I got done, and it would take me a while to figure it out again. Um, I've written it before, though. Uh, you can write a 3D star field by taking... Um, Sorry to interrupt, Ardoni. You're breaking up. I'm breaking up? It might be my headset's dying yeah. or something. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Are we ready? Could you could I to go down to see the code? So you want to see this code or which codes did you want to see the the x86? I don't know. I felt it's kind of like too abstract, like it's going really, really abstract that I, I'm losing myself. I did see a few slides that you showed early, which is the mapping of Java code or C++ to the instruction, yeah. to the assembly. I think that's more sensible. Okay, so yeah, we can go back to that. Um, we'll start at this slide here. So that's the 6502 stuff. It's going to take a second. There we go. And this, yeah, is this X86. seems more human friendly. I don't know if this is any more human friendly to me, but it's, uh, it is, um, there's not supposed to be that uh, squirrely bracket right there, guys. I don't know why that's there. I must have accidentally typed it when I've typed in this stuff. Um, but this is everything to the left of that squirrely brackets fine. And this is that same function, essentially. Um, the reason that the move L, RDI, ECX stuff, which those are registers in the, um, in the actual x86 computer, which is most of the computers we're familiar with, which is the PC computer. The reason that's separated is that's actually how you're getting the values to compare. So all it's saying is you're going to get ECX and EDX from RSI and RDI. Um, if I'd started with x86 assembler, for one, I don't code in x86 assembler almost ever. It is helpful to be able to read x86 assembler. And I do feel that knowing any assembler, whether it be Z80, 6502, even chip eight, which is not a real language, it's a fictional computer esoteric language. Um, because of its similarity to assembler will make reading this stuff easier. But then we compare just like we did in the 6502 earlier. And then if we, if we, if we find out that one is producing a carry, uh, they did name um, these, these uh, mnemonics better here. It says jump if greater to greater. Uh, one of the reasons I really do like 6502 assembler, though, is because um, I know that that's because a subtraction occurred and a carry occurred. That's true here, too. Carries are still used in x86 assembler, but they just went, uh, human beings aren't thinking like that. They're not thinking about the subtraction or anything. It is useful to know that that is how a compare is done, but this just says jump with greater to greater. And so we go to greater and we get the number one and we put it into AL, which is the bottom part of the x86 accumulator. Uh, x86 accumulator scope, um, it's AH for the high bit of A, 
AL for the low bit of A, which is the eight bit parts of a 16 bit address called AX, which is the 16 bit accumulator. And then the 32 bit accumulator is called EAX, which is enhanced EAX. And I don't remember what it goes on from there. Um, it's been a while since I've even looked at a uh, opcode chart. But this is that same code in C over here. This is probably going to be part. Yeah, this is going to be part of this code. I don't know why that isn't selected. Ah, go back. Uh, there is a way to do that. Isn't that it? No, nope. nope, not that. That one? There we go. Okay, so this says the same thing as that assembler code. Um, it says, says it with an if statement, which we won't discuss right now, but I really want to. Uh, if A is greater than B, return one, else return zero. Um, again, this is just showing that knowing x86 assembler or knowing 6502 assembler or any 8-bit assembler or similar would be um, advantageous to knowing how to read this code, which could be useful, not in this particular case, because this code is fairly simple and, and not, not that big of a deal, but it could help you with understanding, A, how to optimize, though this is not the most optimized version of this code either. Um, but A, how to optimize, but again, optimization is often not as important as what we used to think, because um, we can just make faster computers every year. We've, we've broken the, the laws and everything. There, we can, we'll never run out of RAM, guys. Um, but anyway, you know, unless you're the Diablo program. Yeah, we'll just download more. Um, but uh, also the video game developers, they'll run out of RAM, like they they need new consoles every every day, apparently. Because they're like, we can't write real video games anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, we only got four gigahertz of power. That's not enough for a real game. I'm done with them. Uh, so, and this is bytecode. This is not assembler. This is um, bytecode JVM, the whole Java virtual machine, uses the stack for everything. Um, it really, it loads the values from the stack. So it gets the values zero and one from the stack. Um, these values actually have legitimate values put in them. But essentially the way you should think about it is it's very much just like the other example where those values are that A and B. So it's loading A and B, then it's comparing A and B, but it's also doing the branch in the same place as it does the compare. And it says if, if the compare is less than or equal, we're going to go ahead and go to seven and return zero. But if it's not, we'll go ahead and return one. So that's all it's saying there is it's saying if it's less than or equal, um, then we'll go ahead and go to seven. And that's the seven down there. Um, this will then get turned into whatever the Java virtual machine wants to turn it into. These machines are very optimized. Um, especially the Java virtual machine, as everyone knows, it's perfect and cannot be questioned. Uh, and it really is. I, I honestly, I think most of this works okay. And the only thing is, is use C sharp. Um, I love Java actually, but it's fun. It's fun. I won't cry about it. Ew, why? <laughs> Ooh, why? Yes. <laughs> Java and JavaScript is the future. Um, I'm, I'm fine with Java, actually. I, I, I like Java. I, I, I don't hate JavaScript anymore. I, I was right there with you, Mike, for a really long time. But I think it looks so much prettier now. It's still bad. Don't use it. But in the future, <laughs> what we'll actually have is something called, um, and we have it right now. We just don't use it. It's called WebSM. And if you guys have been paying attention to the, the internet stuff, um, that also would be easier to read if you had some experience with assembler. I will tell you it won't be that easy to read because they've tried to simplify it and make it more human readable. Um, to me, it actually makes it a lot less human readable. But the bonus of this is that they do expect that most people are still going to program in high level languages compiled to WebSM. 
and then just use WebSM through a JavaScript uh, front end. So if you needed like a high, a really fast 3D app on the web, um, then you could go ahead and write that whole thing in whatever language you wanted to, compile it to WebSM, all the mission critical stuff would be right there. And then you would just load it with some JavaScript and you're off and running and then you have code running. Um, I doubt anyone will ever really write WebSM by hand. Um, you can, they have uh, compilers on the internet, very similar to um, those CSS and JavaScript testing things. So if you want to learn how to write WebSM, you can, but I will say that the way they tried to fix it into being human readable to me is less readable than any other language I've ever seen. So I, I just, I mean, it's fine if all you want to turn or do is return a value of 42. I can show you guys what this looks like. I don't really remember if I have it bookmarked, but uh, I'm sure I could find it pretty fast. Oh, that's probably right there. WebAssembly concepts. What is WebAssembly? WebAssembly goals. How does WebAssembly fit into the web platform? WebAssembly key concepts. How do I use it in, oh, there we go. That's what I was trying to remember, fiddle. So it's like JavaScript fiddle or CSS fiddle. And you can come in here and you can write code and then you can look at it in various formats. Um, we'll run it first, build it, and then run it maybe. Yep, there it goes. And this is the text format of it which yeah i don't like um it's okay it's just not as easy to read as they think it is and then you also can look at firefox x86 which just puts it directly to x86 or their version of webassem and there's some other stuff here this doesn't look like anything to me um does have that 42 at the end there. There's the binary code for it. But I wouldn't know how to use this to write a 3D game in uh, WebSM. I could return 42, or I could return, I can return any number. I can return 64. Um, maybe I'll read more about this and find a better example that looks prettier, but the outcome of this is still this and while this isn't that dissimilar from what we just saw in the Java virtual machine, and it actually works very much the same as well, to me, this is much harder to read than anything I've ever seen output by the Java virtual machine. Maybe it has some advantage somewhere else, but I doubt it. I think they were intending this to be easier to read by programmers. And if you guys can read that, then more power to you. I, I just, I don't think it's as easy to read, but. It also doesn't explain to me how I'm going to do a division later because I want to do a division or a compare. And I even haven't found, um, I haven't looked that hard, but I haven't found a good opcode list for all of this stuff. So, because for the most part, like they say, they're, they're sitting here going, you're going to just be putting this stuff into whatever language you like and then just compiling it to WebAssembly. So you don't have to actually write WebAssembly at any point in time. Um, a lot of people, not, um, not, not unpopular people, say that this is the future of the web. And for like 3D apps and like whether or not your game is going to run all in your browser and stuff, it may be the future. It has a human readable text format. I don't agree. <laughs> All right, it's cool. Danny, are you ready for questions? Yep. Question and answer. Mike, yeah. you got a one? Earlier you mentioned it. Sure, I can open um, the questions. So um, <clears throat> for people who have experience in whatever language, but um, you know, experience doing software engineering, we have like, IDEs and test methodology and test frameworks and all this kind of stuff, um, like a whole kind of sophisticated tool set in whatever higher level language you're using, right? 
Do you know what what's it what's the code organization like for assembly um and do they have similar sorts of things at the assembly level so um I, I, I would say not not what you're talking about. Like, so you can get you can get WRDX to run in VS Code. You can compile to it and everything. You would have to then have a target machine, and you'd have to run on the target machine. So you could use VS Code for all of your coding. Um, you could then use something like uh, MoCas, um, NES, or MoCas Game Boy. Uh, I just don't remember his address all the time. This guy do they is not famous. Usually, sorry, I was just going to say, do they not usually bundle a test suite with their code or something like that? Because normally when you would go and look at, say, some open source package or a um, um, yes, library or something, or something they'll, like you could download and compile it, yes, but you could also run all the tests for it. Um, yeah. Like I'm picking unit tests, you know, integration tests, functional tests, whatever kind of test. I don't know what that looks like at the assembly level. So there's a lot of things that will make assembler easy for you, easier for you. Assembler is never going to be the easiest. Like, I mean, um, and testing is, is complicated too, but there is, so on this web page right here, this is a guy who made emulators for a really long time. I paid for his 8-bit Game Boy emulator debugger back in the day, um, and it was awesome. It's amazing. It's, it's got so many features, and it was really easy to debug my code. If something broke, I could find it really fast. I could watch for anything I needed to watch for, but it is very much assembler debugging. It's not like test-driven development. Um, there'd be a lot of overhead to, like, if you were for a real computer that runs these kind of, uh, op these type of systems, there'd be a lot of overhead. Now, in x86 land, if someone is, is suicidal, uh, I mean, committed to doing x86, I'm sure by now someone has come up with test suites and things like that that are much better suited to it because a modern computer could handle that. But most of the stuff I deal with is older computers, and there's just not any way that I would include a bunch of, like, I would include very much what the guy said before, I would include some way to print something if something went wrong. So that way I could test, oh, something went wrong there, right? Like, and I could get all the values back and all that stuff. So if I could return every value that I, that I possibly had, as long as I didn't run out of RAM or something, I could store those values in RAM. And then when the system crashed, um, if I, if I was right about where I thought it was going to crash, then I could at least look at those values and go, ah, that's why it crashed. This number should have never been that number. But there's not test-driven development like there would be in uh, modern language, like uh, high-level language, which is running on a computer that is much more powerful than these computers. Um, this is the closest you would get. You would get a good debugger. Uh, the only thing I need to mention here, because we are talking about the 6502 for the most part, is he used a completely different syntax for everything he did with NoCas NES, which is his NES emulator. And so if you ever look at his code, um, which I did earlier today, because I was... Um, We'll save it. Yeah, I don't really need. I need to save it like this because I just need it to show up down here. And then we'll look at his code. And he also has a assembler inside of his of his system. Now everything I talked to you about uh, load a stuff like that. Like he's first thing he's putting. So I don't know what all these names mean, and this is a problem in in programming in general but in particular it looks like he was a little lazy with some of these names some of them i could guess what they mean but i don't know what all these names mean but these are just places that he's putting this for memory so he can go i need this to be here i need this to be here i need this to be this value i need this to be this value things like that and then he's coming down here and eventually he gets to the code most of this is just um space that he's dedicating to things that he can use for later and come on down here to where he's actually got some code and 
earlier when we did a shift right, it was logical shift right, so LSR, but he does shift right, and then you have to have the A there. He also does, rather than do a branch, he does a JE, which is a jump if equal. Um, he's also comparing, and he has to specify A before he compares it to the V blank count plus zero. Um, this is uh, not what I'm used to looking at, and also not what 6502 assembler looks like. He does a move A here. This is similar to, um, I don't know what it's most similar to. It's similar, it's not completely unfamiliar if I was coding in Z80, which is his best emulator. His best emulator is the Game Boy, uh, the Game Boy emulator, and his Game Boy emulator was really easy to read and of course was the same syntax that I'm used to. As far as I know, and I have I've tried looking into this a lot, I don't think anyone else uses the syntax but him. So unless you want to dedicate yourself to this syntax, unfortunately, uh, he's not great for 6502 assembler. Um, WLDX compiles 6502 assembler would let you do a lot of the shortcuts that are there, but he doesn't have a debugger anywhere that would be useful to you. So he doesn't have anything that would be that good. Um, he does write symbol files, which are for debugging, um, but he only writes them for the NoCast SNES, which I haven't looked at the syntax for NoCast SNES, but I assume it's almost probably going to be as horrible as the NoCast NES. Um, I also know that he had a problem because he called his emulator NoCast, and he... Uh, got in a little trouble because eventually he said, I would like donations. Like I'm still gonna give away the emulator for free, but if people donate, they'll get it a little bit sooner. And I will include the features that you need for debugging games and stuff. And not everyone needed that. So it wasn't that big of a deal. And a lot of people did, well, not a lot of people, but I paid, some other people surely paid. And, but he, he did get upset because a lot of people basically wrote death threats to him at that point in time. Like, oh my God, you've just ruined my life because, and now I'm going to have to kill you because you decided to charge for something that you worked really hard on. Um, at that point, I have a feeling that he probably got pretty pissed to the community. And so later on when he wrote no cast and yes, that might just be him going, if you want a feature here, I'm gonna give it to you for free. It's gonna be the version I want. And then if you, pro he probably does, because he normally, back in the day, he would sell this to companies who were trying to make these games. Um, and there are still companies out there making SNES games, not a lot of them, but there are people that are getting together and are like, I would love to make an SNES game. Um, about a year ago, there was a Genesis, a brand new Genesis RPG released um, and stuff like that. So that happens almost every other year. And so he might have that that way so that way people would pay for the option that he could change the language support but i haven't ever found anyone else who uses his syntax but yes that's how you would do it you would do it with a debugger and it would not be the same as test driven development to write test driven development in 6502 assembler or z80 uh, or any other 8-bit assembler you would have to commit a good amount of your processing time to to checking all of this stuff and if, uh, you know, just like normal, you don't want your tests getting into your production, but it would be very hard to, you need to make sure that everything's not coupled and things like that. And I just don't think it'd be very easy to do on older processors like this. So are there good ways? No, um, but learning to debug is actually a good thing to do as well. Um, learning to debug assembler is also a good thing to do because sometimes, you won't need to do that and you'll just need to check variables and things like that and use a good debugger for a high level language but there are occasions when people have been completely confused about why something's going wrong and it ended up being because they didn't know how something was working down at the lower levels does that make okay. any sense yeah yeah sure um i have another question but i want to yield in case someone else has a question So, I like I said, good. yeah, I, know, I think you're I know, good to um, go. 
yeah, I know a, a lot of this was confusing, but like I said before, if you come to this website here, his tutorial starts off with, so just to reload it real quick, so that it doesn't have all my code all over it. His code literally just starts off with, he's gonna draw three colors to the screen in order, and he'll go over it piece by piece here. I think a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today will make more sense when you read through this. Um, I hope so, at least. Like I said, I haven't read through all of it myself. I did different tutorials back in the day, so this wasn't available to me when I was. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read through it yet, obviously, but um, I'm also kind of curious what, what guidelines, if any, um, exist out there for how to organize assembly code. Because there's like, coming from a Java background, there's Java very strong conventions about how you organize your code. Um, and, you know, you have interfaces and implementations, you have classes, you have packages, you have all this kind of sort of organizational framework and you have uh -huh. similar kinds of things with like Python and um, JavaScript has different kinds of, um, you know, require whatever, but like, how, how would he talk a little bit about how code is organized is it basically up to each author are there guidelines um that's so it, it's it is within it is generally i mean so there were some things that people would generally say are true amongst all communities but it was generally up to the author and more than likely if there were more than one or two people working on code it would have to be there'd have to be some kind of rule set they'd have to say don't do this don't do this um or if if you know, they wanted to make sure that things were organized in a certain way so that the guy who's doing the sound part doesn't have to worry about what the guy who's writing the rest of the game is doing. Um, those two people might have to work on something that they're going to say, I, you can't do this or I need this much space or things like that. It's not quite the same as what we're like. A lot of what I dealt with was like the NES and, and how to program the NES. The Commodore 64 or the VIC-20 might have been different in that regard. For one, you did have people who were coding. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. But let's talk about the NES a little bit then because you're more familiar with that. Do you yeah. organize it into, you know, di directories based on stage? Do you have sprites and graphics in one directory? Like, how do you, how, it's a huge, it seems like a huge undertaking. How would you even go about organizing yeah, so, the so you know? you're going to have you're going to have your sound code just like you said it's going to be separated into what it what i actually need it to do um so if i was to write an entire like if i'm writing a demo i'll be honest i don't organize anything it's all the same thing it's very linear code just like horrible javascript code back in the day um, one big file but if uh, big file big file <laughs> but if i if i'm if i'm if i'm writing something and i'm like oh my god i want to i want to make this you know the greatest game that's ever been made on a on a system that's really really old um then i would separate it out and in i do know that in fact several of the people who have finished their games of course also did that um if you guys haven't ever seen d-pad hero I recommend D-Pad Hero. Um, I'm a shill for all people who make cool things on the NES, by the way. Uh, but you have D-Pad Hero, NES. Um, I thought it had videos or something on it, but it, maybe it doesn't anymore. Um, well, it does have the music and you can also play it on Spotify. I don't know if this is, I'm hoping this is the actual music from, because I have Spotify, but. No, this is just Michael Jackson's bad. I don't care about that. I want you to actually. So we'll, we'll do the worst thing in the world to do, especially right now, because guys, I, I went to something and watched something on something. And so if, if this ends up being something crazy, uh, I don't see anything crazy here. I mean, I don't know why that girl already shows up, but um, other than that, I'm not too disturbed by all of this. My ad blocks aren't good. Um, but D-pad hero. It's guitar hero, if you guys haven't guessed that already. But
And yes, I love this music. But we'll, we'll fast forward through some of it. So that's how you play the game. But these guys came up with this game. They would have separated it out and stuff. Even though it would have been a simple game, to be honest. Um, they really focused mostly on the audience reaction stuff and, of course, the, uh, the music. Which we can talk about trackers later on, guys. Um, okay, that's enough music because I know you are all enjoying it, but uh, not as much as me. So yeah, I would separate it into files. I don't think it's um, I don't think anything's changed. Um, I mean, we've learned more as we've gone along and such, but like I also would do functions like i would do my pixel set function and on my pixel set sex unlike well i'm not sure i agree with high level level languages and commenting i don't mind commenting occasionally but sometimes i read some comments and there's too many of them and i'm like i won't ever read your comments anymore because your code should explain your comment not your if i have to read a book about how your code works then write your code in a way that i can tell what it's doing but that wasn't that easy to do here, but we did get some things. So I could do this. This, this assembler is not great for anything other than learning. Uh, I do think it's great to learn on this because it's gonna be simple. You can watch memory, you can do several little things, but it doesn't have cool features that like WLDX would have or anything, but I can do this and say, I want that address. But what I want to be at that address is called, um, what did we say it was the least significant? So least significant, we're going to name it horribly. I, I don't like that either. Least, I don't know how many, how big I can make the name. But like, I have a question following up. So Mike uh -huh. mentioned if you have any organization for that. Honestly, I don't think there is, but you said you can do your files all these simple tricks like you did with text. But what if you're building a really complicated and sophisticated app, like a game app, and then the line grows to more than 5,000, then how are you gonna trace it back? So uh, the first thing is you look for what uh, your program is actually doing at the point when it crashes. So to give an example, the only thing I can think of that's really relevant a lot that I did um, is, when we used to, when, so a guy named Kevin, Kevin Horton came up with this concept. He was going to make chip tunes for the NES and they were, and he called them Nintendo sound format, which is NSF. To find out where the code for the music engine started, all you had to know was that within the NES, and I could be wrong about these numbers, but the, all of the registers for the sound parts of the NES are from 4,000 to 4,017, maybe higher than that, I can't really remember. And so you look for any rights to 4,000 essentially, and particularly those sound registers. And as soon as you found those, you would trace them back from there to find out what had happened. Now, all you have to do is if your code crashes, like say if it, if it crashes, Inexplicably, you're probably right. Like, I mean, 6,000 lines of code, it's gonna be really hard to go through all 6,000 lines of code and find out what's wrong there. More importantly, all the time, um, games did ship with what were unknown bugs. I mean, everyone knows about the zero level in um, Mario, Super Mario Brothers. Um, everyone knows about the uh, ability to walk through walls in Zelda for the Game Boy Color or Game Boy. Um, there were other hacks there as well. As I mentioned, someone had accidentally put in an unsupported operate, op, uh, op code into an NES game and it was unsupported, but it worked. So that wasn't really a bug, like nothing actually broke because of it. It just wasn't supposed to use it. And it could have broke if at any point Nintendo released a new version of the system and said that unsupported opcode doesn't exist anymore. And instead what we'll put there is just a return. And if they just put a return in that space instead of a no-op, which is no operation, 
then that code would have broke completely. And then your game would no longer work. And people would be mad at Nintendo probably because they bought a new Nintendo and their favorite game doesn't run on it. Um, but in general, you can find like, so you will find something where you're like, okay, well, we got to this level and at this level, this game just crashed. Yes, I have 6,000 lines of code, but it's got to be something related to this level. So I could watch the memory. I can, I can do that. I can watch the memory and go, what's going on in memory that looks odd? Like, I know I only write to a couple addresses at this point. Like, I only care about, like, is it when I pick up the apple that something goes wrong? If it's when I pick up the apple that something goes wrong, I could put a trace on that and go, if this variable changes, be like, once this variable changes, I want you to stop, and then I could trace back from that point and see if it on a stage, huh? Um, on a stage, I just said. Say that again. I oh, know. I said I understand. Yeah, we understand. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just I I think of the example like one of the biggest um like most unbelievable. It's almost like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, that game by Chris Sawyer, Roller Coaster Tycoon. Uh -huh. The original Roller Coaster Tycoon was written completely in assembly. Yeah. Crazy. I can't imagine. And it wasn't that buggy, to be honest. I mean, considering that the, the, the kind of game it was and everything, it wasn't, it wasn't unpolished. It wasn't, so, you know. So you can test each piece of code. Like, so once, I'm sorry. Like, Danny, like... Go ahead. I... Hey, to interrupt, but um, we have to close. I mean, we can stay, but uh, yeah. it's already past 12. And now we'll, you, anyone who are in rush for something else, feel free to draw. But yeah, we can stay, Mike. Do we uh, want to stop the recording at this point then? Uh, yeah, I think we shall. Yeah, I shall stop the recording now.